Are you looking for truth from God's word that you can understand and apply to your life? You'll find it today on Make It Clear with Dr. Stan Pons, Bible teacher and president of Clarity Christian College, formerly known as Florida Bible College. Listen now as Stan makes it clear. Some of you are probably saying, no, things are going pretty good. The kids are doing okay. My wife's doing all right. Things are going okay at work. My car is working fine. Then I'd like to say to you, that it could be that God in His sovereign wisdom knows that you're going to face something in the very near future that He has graciously given you information to prepare you for that so that you can go through it with a real sense of our God is greater, our God is powerful for you. And then maybe there's going to be some of you that have come to a point that it's not about you and you don't care about your helpless and hopeless condition. What you want to do now is to help others that are going through some struggles. And I believe that today God's Word will equip you to help that as well. And so I hope that today this message will strike every one of us right where we are if we have this sense of can things change? Can I have a transformed life even though it seems helpless and hopeless? Now to do that I don't want to give you three points in a poem. I don't want to read to you a whole bunch of sad stories and about people who have overcome their adversities. What I would like to do is to actually teach you God's Word. And that's why many people are coming to churches because they want to really learn God's Word. So let me encourage you to do the first thing is to open your own Bibles. And I hope you brought them today. And turn, if you will, to John chapter 5. If you came without a Bible, that can happen. If you look for a Bible in a pew rack under your chair or something, you can certainly find a Bible there. And those of you that would like to just follow along in the uh, worship outline that you have in front of you for the message, that might be very helpful. So if you will turn to John chapter 5 chapter 5 because I'd like to share with you the the event that really occurred about a man who'd been lame for some 38 years. Would you allow me just for a few moments to read this passage of scripture to you and then we'll begin to pick it apart almost word by word here. Let's look together at John chapter 5 verses 1 through 9 and just follow along silently while I read it to you. This is God's word now. This is an event that occurred, and not only did it occur, God wanted it to be recorded and wholly written and preserved thousands of years so we would have it today. So this has special meaning for all of us. Verse 1 says this, After these things there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porticos. And in these lay a multitude of those who were sick, blind, lame, and withered. And then you're going to see in brackets, which I'll talk about later on for those of you that have it in your translation. Waiting for the moving of the waters, for an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool and stirred up the water. Whoever then first, after the stirring up of the water, stepped in, was made well from whatever disease with which he was afflicted. End bracket. Now verse 5. A man was there who had been ill for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been a long time in that condition, he said to him, Do you wish to get well? And the sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. While I'm coming, another steps down before me. And Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your pallet and walk. Immediately the man became well and picked up his pallet and began to walk. Now it was the Sabbath on that day. Well, to let you know where this story fits in, because I don't want you to think it's a neat little story that we're going to now just leave alone. They're all just kind of connected as little comics on a strip somewhere. Actually, this story fits into a bigger picture of what God is doing, and it is so big and so profound that I would never have a lifetime to be able to explain all of it to you, but you need to know it's more than just a story of a lame man who got healed. It is talking about Jesus Christ and where he was and what he was doing and he's getting ready to set himself up for a tremendous amount of persecution. But to do that, let me give you a little bit of a geography lesson and a little bit of a lesson in history. So go back to verse 1, if you will, and it says this. After these things, there was a feast of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now what you're going to see in this story and next week is two things about the Lord. The first thing you're going to learn about is going to be the wonderful works of the Lord, particularly in His healing. Now we've seen how He's healed people in the past, particularly the nobleman's son. Today we're going to learn about a man who's been healed for 38 years that he was lame. Then we're going to talk about how that a person who was blind was healed and someone that was so sick they were dead, so to speak, and He brings them back to life. And all that is pivotal because something about is going to occur to cause everybody that's particularly the Jewish leaders to really look at Christ 
and want to bring him down. So we're going to talk about his works. But then we're also going to talk about who Jesus is. Now today I'll talk a little bit about who Jesus is on three of his attributes. But at the same time I want you to know that we're going to be moving next week to talk about who Jesus is. I got thinking about this because of the country in which we live today. In a few months or so we're going to be voting on two men that are going to be running basically for president. One man, the best that I can sense from what he has said himself, is that he doesn't believe that Jesus Christ is the only God. The other man is a man who believes that Jesus Christ is not equal to God. So in a sense, if they don't believe that Jesus is God or Jesus is equal to God, then I could deduce from that that they are in some form, from the Bible perspective, they are godless in the sense of the true God. And so when I look at that, of people in tremendous places of influence, and we know that they have influence, although there's checks and balances with our system, they still are in positions of influence, it could be that the world will actually get worse no matter who goes into office because of what's going to happen when God is not fully on the throne. At the same time, we know that God can work way beyond man because his way is perfect, and he controls the heart of a king like he can direct the course of a river. That's how our God is sovereign. And through these people and through the events in the future, there may be an unleashing of God's judgment on all of our lives in some measure that will cause us to come to a point that we feel hopeless and helpless. But I want you to know, in spite of all of that, Jesus is God. He is on the throne. Nothing happens apart from his permission. And all of it is not so that we become better and have a better life here. It's also that he would receive the glory. And through all of that, that by us coming to him by faith alone, that we then can enter into an eternal relationship with God. And that may, maybe not here will ever get better for all of us. But I can tell you, it will be infinitely perfect after we die, as long as we trusted Christ as our personal Savior. So if you look at the first part of it, it talks about, in these things there was a feast of the Jews, and he went down to Jerusalem, and there is in Jerusalem the sheep gate and the pool, etc. I'm going to have put up on the screen, if they will, I'm going to show you a little bit of a map here to show you what's happening with Christ, so you can see. I know there's a lot of little tiny cities here, and you really can't see that, but can you see my bouncing little red light? If you can see that red light bouncing around up there, say, uh-huh. I love doing this. We have two cats, and I like to run it up the wall, and those cats go crazy. But uh, let's go back over here. The most important thing that you might really want to know is the fact that you're going to see up here the area of Cana. You know that the Lord has done some tremendous miracles there, two of them especially. He did it in Cana, although the boy was in Capernaum over here. He's up in the northern area. At that particular time, there was not a lot of pushback from the Jewish leaders when he was in the northern area. Now he's making his way back down to the southern area where Jerusalem is, and that's where there's going to be the beginning now, and you'll hear this next week, the pushback of the Jews. Now, between here and when he comes into Jerusalem, when it says after these things, John is not talking about those things. You have to go to Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and you're going to find more of the story chronologically of what happens from the time he was up here in Cana and the time he moves back to Jerusalem. Most of you know when you study John that it talks about the first week of Jesus' life and it talks a lot about the last week of Jesus' life. You really have to go to the other Gospels to find out what happens in between. Now, that doesn't mean that John didn't know what was going on. What it does mean is God wanted us to know in a sandwich fashion the beginning of the life of Christ and then at the end of the life of Christ on this earth because there's profound things because the theme of the book is, of course, belief for life. And that's what he's talking about. So he's moving down into Jerusalem and I wanted you to know Jerusalem is more down in this direction and we see Capernaum up a little bit higher. Let's go a little bit further here. We talked about Israel. I want to show you another slide up here. This next slide, if you will show it up there, this is going to be... Jerusalem. Now, how many of you have ever had the privilege of traveling to Israel on a, maybe a Holy Land tour? Would you raise your hand? Great. That means most of you haven't. I'd like you to pray with me because Carol and I have hosted three trips to, to Israel and maybe the Lord will open it up that you might be able to go with us should the Lord open up for us to be able to go. When you go to Jerusalem, there's a lot you can see there. But when we talk about Jerusalem, you need to know what's happening because in this verse it talks about the Sheep Gate, the Pool of Bethesda. What does all that mean to us and what's happening at that particular time? So it's too hard for me to show you on the map, but I wanted to kind of give you a visual, then I'll give you a real good visual here. This would be mainly the Temple Mount area, the Holy of Holies. The Sheep Gate is up in that particular area, the northeast corner, and the Pool of Bethesda is a little bit more up in this area here. We're going to talk about the Pool of Bethesda in just a moment. You're saying, what does that have to do with our story today? Follow me and you will. Let's pretend just for a moment that this sanctuary here happens to be the city of Jerusalem. Just like these 
This room has walls around it to kind of protect us from the elements, maybe people from breaking in at night. Jerusalem also had walls around it as well. Now, in the center of the city was a lot of people that would live, but there was a corner of the city which was also known as the Temple Mount. And for just general purposes, we're going to let this platform right here represent the Temple Mount. But not the whole Temple Mount didn't contain all just the Temple. The Temple Mount had the temple in it, which would be a little bit more up here on the platform. So you'd have the temple mount, then you'd have the temple. Those of you who went, you probably remember that close to the walls of the temple, that today the Jews will come, and it's called the Wailing Wall. They'll go up there, mostly men, usually men, they'll be praying, they'll be sticking their paper into the wall at that time, trying to just lead their prayer request. That's the Wailing Wall of the temple. When you go a little bit further in there, maybe where this drum set is, generally speaking, would be the Holy of Holies. Now don't say that drums are Holy of Holies. I'm just saying that's where it's located, all right? So that's where the, the big center of the Holy of Holies would be. The Sheep Gate would be a little bit further back. Now, why would they call it the Sheep Gate? That's kind of interesting. Well, I think the reason they call it the Sheep Gate is because if you recall in the Old Testament when they're doing all the sacrifices, most of the sacrifices were the lambs and the sheep. Remember John 1. Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. So the sheep would come in through that gate because it was closest to the place where they would do the sacrifices. But outside those walls would be what was known as the Pool of Bethesda. Now here's what gets real interesting. About 50 years ago, 50, 55 years ago, people were questioning whether there really was a Pool of Bethesda because they could never find where was this located. But about 40 to 45 years ago, they began to do an excavation by St. Stephen's Cathedral over there. And they have Catholic churches and monasteries all over the Middle East. You know that, where they have that. Well, they were doing some digging there. And what did they find? As they dug, they found this massive set of pools and the porticos, the porches that were there. Back in 1977, we hosted our first trip to Israel. When we got there, they just finished excav excavating that area. So we were one of the first people to see, while they were still dusting off the rocks and letting us be able to see, the Pool of Bethesda. Now you can go. It's all been cleaned off. Often when someone will come there, a tour guide, they'll stop, tell you all about it. If you have a preacher with you, he'll tell you the story of what I'm telling you here today. It is a profound and important finding. Which for those of you that are start, starting to think, I wonder if this Bible is inspired. If you lived 60 years ago, you might question, oh, there's something in the Bible. There's no pool. We haven't found no pool there. The Bible might not be trusted. Well, I have to tell you that almost every time they dig into the ground as an archaeologist, what are they doing? They're finding more proofs of the Word of God. In fact, the whole study of archaeology was started by a group of people that wanted to show you that wherever there was supposed to be a tell or a mound or a location in the Bible, it's not going to be there. So they're going to say, I'm going to disprove the Bible by going there and digging and showing that it's not there. When they got there, they started digging and archaeology did just the opposite. It really did prove that there was the place where the Bible said there would be. Now, yes, it's true. There are still places in the Bible we have not found just yet, but that does not mean that they are not there. It just means that they have not been dug up. Did you hear about the lady who wanted to be an archaeologist so she could dig up a man? I thought I'd throw that in for free. Back to this. Now, what you want to know is where it says here the Sheep Gate, and then it says by Bethesda. Now, that word Bethesda in Hebrew is a very interesting word. It means a place or a house of mercy or a place or a house of outpouring. Now, most of you probably have heard of our military hospitals the one that would be called Walter Reed. They had another naval hospital. They combined them both together because of economics back in the 80s, late 90s, and all of that. But you'd also be, it would be referred to as, you know, the hospital, the Bethesda hospitals. Well, it's not that the hospitals were called Bethesda. What was interesting is that it was in Bethesda, Maryland. How did it get its name? Because the very first group of people that were in Maryland at that time started a church, and that church was called Bethesda because they wanted to heal those early Puritans, and they would come together for a time of outpouring of God's mercy as they were planting a church in the new founding of the United States of America in Bethesda, a place of healing. Well, let's go a little bit further. Talked about the feast there, so we can say there's two things we need to learn. The picture of Israel and the picture of Jerusalem. You've got to know those things if you really want to know the Bible. But the second thing is important for us to know would be the calendar. It's good to know geology, or geography rather, and it also is good to know history. And so we see the calendar. Here it says the Feast of the Jews. That may not mean a lot to you, but do you know that John talked about the Feast of the Jews not once, not twice, but six different times in his gospel alone? 
This is the only time he'd call it the Feast of the Jews, but he didn't tell you what feast it was. So I'm not going to spend time telling you that I think it's this feast or that feast. It's not really important because the feast action of what feast it was is not particular to the story. What is particular is this. Jerusalem has so many people in it like we would have here. However, when there was a, quote, convention, the city would swell from 200,000 to over a million people at the time. So when they would have a feast in those days, it would go from about 200,000 people to over a million. So Jerusalem was just jammed with people coming and going. And if it was a masculine time of a feast, it'd be filled with a lot of men at the time, sometimes far more men at that particular feast. So the bottom line is simply this. Jesus moves from his northern miracles to his southern miracles. He's in Jerusalem. He goes to this place. The city is jammed with people, and he happens to go to this particular porch. Now here's what I thought was interesting. This is my opinion. Generally, when a person would go to an area, do you, when you go to a town, want to go to the slums? When you go on a tour bus ride of a particular town, don't you want to see all the special places to go? Wouldn't you want to see the places where there's a lot of excitement going on? Jesus could have gone anywhere in Jerusalem that he would have wanted to. Jesus could have met with anybody he wanted to. He could have gone with any of his disciples. He could have taught them anything he wanted to. But when he traveled after these things and he goes into Jerusalem, he goes right to a place that's just teeming with people. But instead of going to the temple, instead of hanging around with the wealthy people or even visiting Nicodemus again, what does he do? He goes to a place that's filled with, and it doesn't tell you the numbers, except it says multitudes of people that were blind, lame, crippled. These are the people that were there that probably didn't have people to be able to help them. So you can imagine how sick, smelling, emaciated, the degenerates of society, the, the cast-offs that just seemed to come to this pool. Now the big question is, why would they go to this pool? Well, it wasn't just to take a bath. It's because through superstition there was this sense that if we go to this pool, there's going to be some kind of an angel there that's going to come along to stir up the waters, and if we're the first to get into it, we're going to get healed. Well, now that takes us to a passage of Scripture. So let's go to verse 3 and verse 4, and I'd like to explain to it why some of you have it in your Bible and why others don't have it in their Bible. So let's look in verse 3. It says, In these lay a multitude of those who were sick, blind, lame, and withered. Now the brackets, waiting for the moving of waters, for an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool and stirred up the water. Whoever then first, after the stirring up of the water, stepped in, was made well, from whom whatever disease with which he was afflicted. Now, the argument is why it's not there, and then the argument is why was it placed in there. So for those of you that are skeptical on the other side of the authenticity of Scripture, here's what I'd like you to know. We, first of all, do not have any original copies that was actually penned by any of the writers of the Old Testament or the New Testament. We don't have those. But what we do have are thousands and thousands of copies of the original that was written subsequent to the time it was written. And not hundreds of years later, but during that particular time. We have access to all of that and it's been verified by the Dead Sea Scrolls, especially for the Old Testament, found in 1948. So with the scholars and the accessibility to the fragments and the completed manuscript copies, and so many of them, we now have the ability to compare copies together for their accuracy. And yes, sometimes there is a phrase off, sometimes there is a spelling off, sometimes there is a word that's transposed differently. But when you put all of them together, you step back and you read these, you'll find that there is not one truth, one doctrine, one event that has been so changed like changing a male into a female, a dog into a cat. There's no changes like that at all. So when we look at the story and those scholars are now putting it together so that we have it in our translation, we can trust it. Now again to the question, why do we have some Bibles have this in it and some don't? Most good Bibles that would have the what we call literal translation, they will put it in there, but when they do, they'll put it in brackets along with a footnote letting you know that it is not in the earliest manuscripts. Well, let's talk about that for just a moment. When the Bible was written, and then it's now being copied, and I don't have time to go through all of the Bible study methods and apologetics, but enough to give you this, that they have the older manuscript copies. It is true, there's not as many copies, but the argument is, the closer to the time the original was written that these copies are made, hence the more accurate they would be. So they look at the older copies. 
as the scribes were making copies hundreds of years later, not thousands of years later, but just four or five hundred years later, as they're making more copies, obviously there's going to be a little bit of a change. That's why in some scholarship arguments would be, even though we have less copies, if it's closer to the original, that maybe they're more accurate. Others by the, maybe we'll call it the philosophy, that, well, I would rather have more copies to check for accuracy rather than how close they were copied during the time of the original. So that's why you're going to find that in places in Scripture, and you'll find a few places like that, that you're going to see phrases in there, and they're alerting you and me that you know that that is not found during the earliest manuscripts. That seems to show up after hundreds of years. All of a sudden, boom, they're showing up in all of these others. But in this one, it is not found there. So some scholars say, if it's not found in the original ones, therefore it's not there. Others are saying, well, maybe it was there, but they didn't record that because it sounded too superstitious. So we're not going to really buy into that. So now you're wanting to know, what do I believe? For $100, I'll tell you what I believe. No, I'm joking. Here's what I do believe about this. I'm not going to be sucked in totally into that argument except for this. You'll notice that it talks about an angel in there that stirs up the water. Here's what I do know about the study of angelology. There is no reference in the Old Testament of an angel doing anything with water. There is no reference of an angel doing anything in John that does something with water. What we do study is history, not just church history, but cultural, world history. You will find that in certain civilizations that there are certain actions that they will attribute to some angel. But there is no concrete biblical theology that an angel did this. So in some of your translations, it might sound like an angel did it. I don't really believe an angel did it. Do I believe there was a superstitious superstition going on about that? Yes, I do. Now, how did the waters get stirred up? Were they stirred up at all? I believe the waters were stirred up. The reason being is that section of Scripture, the end of verse 3 and all of verse 4, that talks about it. If you took that away, you get to verse 7, and now there is no question. It was in the older manuscripts that the water is being stirred up. So bottom line is, how did the waters get stirred up? Was it an angel? I do not believe it was an angel. I do believe the superstitious thought there was an angel. But I do believe this, the waters were stirred up. So now the question is, is how did they get stirred up? Very easily. As they dug down and found the pool of Bethesda, they discovered that underneath this pool and why there was water in this pool so frequently would be because there were springs that would be flowing underneath just like an aquifer. And occasionally when there'd be a lot of rain, like they do sometimes in San Antonio, the aquifer underground water supply gets so filled with water that water starts coming literally out of holes in the ground because it's percolating up because of so much rain that's there. Now, that being the case, it happened in Jerusalem. A lot of rain hits the rocks. The rocks are like pouring water on a table. It has nowhere to go. It finds the holes, fills up the underground aquifer, then pumps it back out again, and the waters really get stirred. So now they have superstitions. Now, most of you can buy into that superstitious argument because if you go back to culture even today, there are people today that, and I'm not dissing any belief system. I'm just telling you this is their belief system. And then later on we can talk about is it right or wrong. But most of you probably are aware that if you were in India, they have what is known as the Ganges River. And the Ganges River, the study that I've done on it, it's a very sacred river, and it says that every inch of the Ganges River is a sacred place. And that's why the Indians that will go into that water there, they're doing it as a sign of worship, something that they're doing with their God. The real issue is the Ganges River is so polluted, so filthy, that they pump raw sewage into that. Another story of a superstition that people will believe, not true, not biblical. I read recently about how a lady, and this was reported in Times Magazine, so I'm not making these stories up, heard that her child, who was um, physically and emotionally damaged so badly, would only get help if that child would look at the Virgin Mary. They found that the Virgin Mary was in the sun wearing... A crown. So she walked her child up to the top of this hill, and then when the sun shone, where the Virgin Mary was in the sun, she had the boy stare at the sun, she stared at the sun, and you know what happens when you stare at the sun. The writer of the Times article came back down after interviewing her and said, We went up with one of us crippled. We came back down with both of us crippled. 
So there's plenty of superstition. So the issue isn't the angel. And that's why when you go to this whole discussion here, Jesus never even touches a subject about angels because it's not about angels. It's all about him. So you need to have a little bit of that backstory. So with that in mind, let's now pick it up at verse 5. This is Joe Pons, and I want to thank you for listening to Make It Clear with the teaching of Dr. Stan Pons, founder of Make It Clear Ministries and president of Clarity Christian College. Make It Clear is dedicated to taking the Word of God with clarity into every person's world. It's the support of listeners like you who make the ministry of Make It Clear possible. You can provide your tax-deductible gift to Make It Clear online by going to makeitclear.org. That's makeitclear.org. Thank you for helping us make it clear. If you would like to have Dr. Pond speak at your church or event, please email us at tellmemore at makeitclear.org. That's tellmemore at makeitclear.org. Thank you, and remember to make it clear.